Well, go ahead and open your Bibles with me, if you will, to Acts 15 once again. And as you do, this is now our, our third week in, in Acts chapter 15, and specifically our third week in looking at what took place and what was decided upon and what's known as the Jerusalem Council. And I'm going to bring us all up to speed with a quick review uh, momentarily. But the overarching theme, the pervasive question that that's being addressed has been what in, throughout this, these, these verses in chapter 15? It's essentially, it's, it's how can sinners receive God's saving grace? How can we be saved? That's the question that's being asked. Which the answer is what? Sinners are, are saved exclusively by God's grace through faith in Christ alone. Saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. That is a massively important question. And a, with a massively important answer to that question. Question. <laughs> but there's another question that is also massively important that needs to be both asked and answered as well. And that goes along with this question, but it's what does this faith look like in the life of the one who possesses this saving faith? So it's what does saving faith actually look like? Not just how are we saved, but what does that mean for our life going forward? And that's the question that begins to be addressed today. I say begins because it's a question we could spend so much time on and the scriptures do spend so much time on. But quick review, Paul and Barnabas have recently returned from their, their first missionary journey returning to the church that sent them out, the church there in Antioch, and have shared with them everything that the Lord has done on their journey. So they come back, giant missionary share service. They're telling everything that the Lord had done, including how the Lord had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Even the Gentiles are receiving the Holy Spirit. Even the Gentiles are, are coming to, to faith. But then not long after this share service, as they continued to disciple, as they continued to teach, we're told some men made their way up from Jerusalem, up from Judea, to Antioch. And they began teaching the church that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. They're teaching this, and, and let's just say this didn't sit well with Paul and Barnabas, <laughs> Verse 2 telling us that they had no small dissension and debate with these men. I can just picture the scene. These men are, are preaching and teaching that in order to be saved, you had to believe in Jesus, yes. Plus, you also had to be circumcised. You also had to live a life in obedience to the law. Paul and Barnabas, on the other hand, are, are preaching that salvation comes exclusively by God's grace through faith in Christ alone. No circumcision or obedience to the law required in order to be saved. So you've got two clear opposing views, two dichotomous views taking place here, and the debate escalates here to the point where the church in Antioch sends Paul and Barnabas and some other men from the church, they, they send them to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles and the elders of the church there in Jerusalem to come to some kind of, of resolution. And when they arrive in Jerusalem, the debate, as you can imagine, continues. And after much back and forth, Peter stands up and he shares the events that took place in Acts chapter 10 and in Acts chapter 11, and he shares how Cornelius' household, a, a Gentile household, received the Spirit just as they received the Spirit back at Pentecost exclusively through faith. No circumcision required. They've received the Spirit. 
And then after Peter finished, Paul and Barnabas stood up. And they shared the experience that they had on their missionary journey and how they witnessed Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit and forgiveness of sins exclusively by God's grace through faith in Christ. And when they had finished, James, the brother of Jesus, rose up. And he pointed to the Old Testament scriptures and he said, with these testimonies, the words of the prophets agree. Meaning James is saying, everything Peter and Paul and Barnabas have experienced and that they have told you are in full agreement with what the prophets have said and what is within the Old Testament scriptures. And then James says, verse 19, therefore. Again, you always ask, what is the therefore, therefore? The therefore is therefore for everything we just said. Therefore, because of this, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. <clears throat> the brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia, greeting. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, <clears throat> and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So here's the summation of all the Jerusalem council. After hearing from Peter and Paul and Barnabas and James, the assembled council comes to one accord. They, they come to an agreed upon unified decision that the forgiveness of sins, whether for Jew or for Gentile, and the gift of the Holy Spirit are received exclusively by God's grace through faith in Christ alone. This is the good news of the gospel made known. This is the good news of the gospel being proclaimed. And in response, they compose this letter back to the church in Antioch to tell them what had been decided, telling them in this letter, hey, those men who came up to you and were teaching something different than this, yeah, they didn't come upon our authority. We did not send them up to talk to you. And then to affirm this further, to affirm that Paul and Barnabas just weren't going back and saying, hey, here's a letter. And they send witnesses back with them, not only to deliver the letter, but again, to give additional testimony to the validity of the letter. But did you notice 
how based on James's recommendation, they also include some requirements in this letter. These requirements being things that the church in Antioch, and specifically the Galatian converts, should abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, and from blood. And they're told, if you keep yourselves from these, if you keep yourself from these things, you will do well. And then, when the church in Antioch hears this, and they hear the letter read, how do they respond? They rejoice because of its encouragement. And as you can imagine, I've got questions. <laughs> I would think all of us would have questions as we're reading this. I'm like, why? <laughs> First, like, why would any moral requirements be included in a letter such as this at all? Like, why? <laughs> if the gospel is truly a gift of God's grace, then why are these moral requirements there? And second, why is the church in Antioch rejoicing and encouraged by these requirements? (laughs) Why? And here's why. Just cutting straight to the point. Because what's being articulated in this letter and through these requirements is that to become a Christian, Gentiles don't have to become Jews. Meaning they don't have to become circumcised. They don't have to come under the authority of the law of Moses in order to be saved. Salvation is by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. But while Gentiles don't have to become Jews in order to become Christians, neither can they remain as pagans. Can't be a Christian and live a life that is consistently inconsistent with the gospel you claim to believe. Same holds true today. Yes, God's grace is free to everyone who believes. But this doesn't mean that faith doesn't come without a cost. The call to follow Jesus comes with a great cost. But a cost that is exceeded by an even greater treasure, an even greater reward. And this is where we're going to flush out and press into this morning. First, by reinforcing that number one, God's grace is received exclusively by faith in Christ alone. I want to just continue to hammer this home. Again, this, this is the overarching emphasis of the Jerusalem Council. If they were leaving with a thesis statement, this is it. Sinners are justified. Sinners are declared right before the holy God, not by works, but through faith in Christ alone. James has heard Peter's testimony. He's heard Paul's testimony. And he's seen and he's shown what these men have testified is in perfect agreement with the scriptures. Verse 19, therefore, We should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. In other words, we must not place any obstacle like circumcision or obedience to the law before them as requirements in order to be saved. Bring this into modern day. Bring this to everyday application. It's not faith in Jesus plus baptism that saves. It's just faith in Jesus. It's not faith in Jesus plus taking the Lord's Supper that saves. It's just faith in Jesus. It's not faith in Jesus plus responding to an altar call or walking an aisle or joining a church that saves. It's just faith faith in Jesus. It's not getting your life all cleaned up and turning away from your sins that saves you. It's God's grace received exclusively through faith in Christ that saves. Just as Paul preached 
on his missionary journey back in Acts chapter 13, he's saying, by him, by Jesus, everyone who believes, and you know who everyone stands for? Everyone. Like every single person who believes, everyone is freed from everything. Does everything mean some things? No, it means everything. Everyone who believes, has faith, is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. The law will never set you free. Only the grace of God. No strings attached. This is good news. This is the gospel. Meaning, Jesus plus anything equals a false gospel that will lead to damnation. It will lead to destruction. It will lead to everlasting torment. It is not the truth. It does not bring forth hope. But now let's think for a moment. Let's think for a moment how this can be misunderstood, misapplied. Could be misunderstood and misapplied in any number of ways. I'll admit that right off the, the top. But one of my big concerns both then and now, uh, as it applies to such a free offer of grace, something I've heard over and over again, is that people will equate it or understand it in one way or another to be some type of license to sin, a a freedom to sin. Even though they may not use that language in the process, that's kind of what it comes back to. Adults here thinking like children. You mean, if I believe in Jesus... You tell me I can do whatever I want with no penalty? Especially when we couple in the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. (laughs) You're like, you're telling me I can do whatever I want with no penalty? Because if if that were the case, and let's use ice cream as the example, all right? Or your favorite dessert, if ice cream's not your thing. Ice cream's my thing, I'll put in ice cream. You, whatever it is, but let's say ice cream is the metaphor for whatever sin that is. So you fill in the blank. But someone says, you mean if I believe in Jesus, I can have all the ice cream I want? Like all of it? Like go to Baskin Robbins, go to Dairy Queen, and I can just have it all right there? And no calories are going to count? The sugar is not going to affect me at all? (laughs) Now we're talking. There's not going to be anyone to shame me or judge me or tell me no. I can just have as much ice cream as I want with no penalty as long as I have faith. Now I can see how someone might hear such an offer of grace received exclusively through faith and respond this way. I've seen it. I've heard it. And if that's what we hear, then how are we likely to respond? Bring on the ice cream. (laughs) Like, just bring it. Let's go. But friends, this is why we see faith, belief, and repentance going hand in hand all throughout the scriptures. Because without genuine faith, repentance doesn't exist. And without repentance, there's no evidence of genuine faith. See, faith in Jesus is turning from our sin. That's what repentance is. It equals a a turning from It's a turning away from something towards something else. So walking this way, pursuing this worldly, earthly treasure, pursuing this. And then the Lord grabs a hold of my heart. I believe that Jesus Christ is the greatest treasure, the greater treasure, greatest treasure. And I turn from what has captivated my heart to now turn to follow Christ, the greatest of all treasures. What capitulated, what brought about that turn, 
that repentance to even desire to follow Christ. The Holy Spirit working through faith, instilling faith in the life. Right? I'm walking by faith. That's what's taking place. So turning, repenting from one life, one treasure, which is an act of faith, and turning to Jesus, who is our greatest treasure, and continue to walk in faith, faithfully following him from that point forward, continually repenting of those things that vie for our heart's affection over Jesus, continuing to trust him through faith to be our only hope in life and in death. This life of faith and repentance resulting in a changed life. Continually looking to follow Christ is an act of continual faith and repentance. Changed desires. Meaning, point number two. <clears throat> Genuine faith in Christ equals forgiveness of sin plus a changed life. Notice where the equals comes in. Genuine faith in Christ equals forgiveness of sin. Plus a changed life. The changed life does not equal the forgiveness of sins. As genuine faith in Christ also equals the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit doesn't enter a believer and leave us the same. So here's the dilemma. Or potential dilemma that I'm drawing out here that we have with the Jerusalem Council's conclusion. A dilemma that, let's be clear, neither Peter nor Paul nor, nor James nor any of the believing Gentiles in Antioch seem to have a dilemma with, <laughs> all right? They don't have a dilemma. In fact, we're told that they rejoice and are encouraged by what I see here as a potential dilemma, which tells you there is no dilemma, but there is something we need to work through. What is this potential dilemma? Well, it's the required abstentions placed upon the Gentile believers in this letter. It's faith in Jesus alone equals salvation. Yes. But then they say, but you also must abstain from things polluted by idols, and sexual immorality, what's been strangled, and blood. And at first glance, that seems like a dilemma. Even a contradiction. Like, why are any requirements included at all in this letter if God's grace is truly received through faith alone? Why? Well, quick answer is because the receiving of salvation is not in any way predicated on observing these requirements. Let's be clear. The receiving of salvation is not in any way predicated or determined by observing these requirements. So why then the requirements? Why? Well, two potential reasons. The first being that these things are, are told to, they're told to avoid, again, that is the Things polluted by idols, sexual morality, what's been strangled, blood. It's believed by some that these things are, are drawn from the, the holiness regulations in Leviticus chapter 17 and 18. Because the holiness regulations in Leviticus 17 and 18, uh, these, these requirements or holiness requirements apply to both ethnic Jews and believing Gentiles who were offering sacrifices and offerings to the Lord. And so the thought is that the requirements given here, well, it, it's good wisdom. It's good wisdom given by James and the Jerusalem Council to these Gentile believers in how they're to exercise their newfound Christian liberties. It's good wisdom for how to exercise their freedoms in Christ without making their Jewish neighbor, neighbors stumble especially as it pertains to, again, the Jewish food laws and neighbor, their neighbors may still find unclean. So the thought is, better to eat your steak well done or ruined than create disunity or some sort of stumbling block for your neighbor by, by eating it while it was good, while it still had blood in it. The focus then of the prohibitions is to maintain peaceful fellowship within the body. How to practice your freedom in Christ without making your brothers or sisters stumble. 
But as you can probably infer, I, I have a struggle with this view. And here's my, my struggle with this view. And my struggle's not with the practice. I believe the practice of, of not flaunting our freedoms to make another stumble is both wise and biblical. It is taught extensively throughout multiple places throughout the New Testament. So I'm, I'm not opposed to the idea at all. But I don't think this is the primary focus of these requirements, of this passage. Because what else is mentioned in this list of requirements that has nothing to do with food and is never, ever seen as being morally indifferent or, or a matter of simple Christian liberty anywhere in the Scriptures? Sexual immorality. At no place in Scripture are we ever told, well... As long as it doesn't make your neighbor stumble, then it's okay to go eat as much ice cream as you want. Nowhere do we have that in the scriptures. There are a lot of things that fall under the umbrella of Christian liberty. But sexual immorality isn't one of them. Which is why I, I don't believe that these requirements are pointing to Christian liberty and living in unity among among other believers. See, these four requirements of abstention were also closely associated with various forms of pagan worship during this time. All of these things being a form of pagan, idolatrous worship, which leads me and others to believe that what James is teaching here and the rest of the council is affirming is that for Gentiles to become Christians, they don't have to become Jews. So they don't have to be circumcised, don't have to come under the obedience of the law in order to be saved. But at the same time, they cannot remain as pagans. Can't continue to live unchanged lives marked by the sins of this world. Can't continue offering sacrifices in, in a pagan temple and at the same time faithfully follow Christ. This application crosses over timelessly to today. As faith in Christ results not only in the forgiveness of sin, but in a changed life. Why? Why? How? Because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 and 20, you can jot those down as a note, when he charges the church in Corinth, he charges them to flee from sexual immorality. He's saying, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Chapter 10, verse 14, or they're, they're, they're in the same spot. Flee from idolatry. The key word in Paul's charge is to flee. Flee. Flee from these things. Don't let them mark your life any longer. <laughs> these things in some lives, in some cases, just maybe falling away with no more desire, no more temptation to partake. So you come to faith in Christ and you been carrying this temptation, you've been carrying this sin, and you come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit enters your life, and it's gone. <laughs> praise God. For those of you who have experienced that, praise God. Others, a great number of others, well, are, are deeply, these sins continue to tempt. They continue to taunt. They go away for a while, and then they rear their head wanting to return. It's a continual thorn in our flesh. That's the reason Paul says to flee. And keep fleeing over and over and over and over again. Flee. Don't associate yourself with these things anymore, no matter the cost. Meaning the prohibitions put forth here by James and the Jerusalem Council are, are saying, be wise with how you live your life not simply as a matter of how you observe your Christian liberties, but with your witness to unbelievers. 
your witness within the church. This wisdom applying not only to them, but very much to us. See, in Acts chapter 15, verse 21, James refers to how the, the reading of the law of Moses has been done and continues to be done generation after generation and city after city. We'll see how every new city Paul enters, he goes straight to the synagogue to preach Christ, to share the gospel. So with this in mind, he's saying, be wise, believers, in how you live so you can be a wise believer healthy witness to your unbelieving Jewish neighbors. So you can be a wise in your witness to an unbelieving world. Be salt and light. Same is true for how we live our lives as Christians today. Be salt and light in a very dark world. When the people around us see our life, see your life, how we're living our life on a day-to-day basis. Don't, don't let them see someone who puts on a good appearance of religious adherence, but then doesn't actually love the Lord or God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Don't let them see religious piety. Don't let them see pharisaicalism. Don't let them see these things. But nor, nor should they see us living a life that is simply eh, blends in and is marked by the ways of the world can't be seen participating in and practicing that which God condemns. And the application here is broad. It is extensive, especially within our day and age. All new things that we can be adding to this and what this means. But here's the simple fact. If we are seen participating in things that God clearly condemns, what witness are we putting forth to the watching world? Oh, but what are they going to think about me if I don't go? What are they going to think about me if I don't do? What are they going to think? But friend, what is God going to think? What witness are we putting forth? What evidence is there of genuine faith if we're just participating in the ways of the world over and over and over again? What should the watching world see instead? They should see a distinctly Christian life. Not a Christian life according to Christian culture, but a Christian life according to what God's Word says. They should see Christians who walk by the Spirit, who now indwells them with the power to overcome sin. See, the Spirit is not just saving us from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin. As Paul writes to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Praise God. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, As I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Again, praise God. Verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Paul reminding the church in Galatia and us, Gentiles don't have to become Jews in order to become Christians. But they can't remain as pagans. Jerusalem Council is saying the same thing. Sinners can, cannot consistently remain in the sins of this world and simultaneously possess genuine faith in Jesus. We cannot be Christians according to the Bible's definition of Christian and live a life that is consistently inconsistent with the gospel that we claim to believe. Can't be Christians and refuse to faithfully follow 
Christ. As James tells us in his letter, our, our works don't save us. But faith without works is dead. It's not real. As the Spirit doesn't enter someone's life and then leave them the same. A simple but powerful and massively important truth, friends. This too is so often overlooked and reasoned away for any number of reasons. Most sentimentality and emotionally reasons. But here's what I, I love about the church in Antioch and how they received this. They didn't pout. They're told, like, your life needs to change in this way. And they didn't sit there and be like, well, that's not fun. That's not fair. They didn't pout. They didn't be, oh, what burdens. They rejoiced because of its encouragement. Why? One, because they rejoiced in hearing how God's grace is received exclusively through faith. They rejoiced because, oh, oh yes, those false teachers are false. They're wrong. This is true. We are saved only by God's grace through faith. And they rejoiced too because they found encouragement even within their requirements. Because they didn't see these things in any way as burdensome, but rather as instructive for their sanctification. They wanted to live lives marked by faithful repentance. They wanted to be sought in light in the world of darkness. Thus the reason they rejoiced. And so for my question for you this morning, do you? Do you want to be salt and light? Are you being salt and light? Do these things, these requirements, these things that are encouraging us in our sanctification, do they bring you reason to rejoice? Do they bring you encouragement? Or do you find them burdensome? Do you find them as a weight? And if all, any of these questions, why might this be the way you answer? Maybe you need to talk about these things. Maybe you need to understand more about how God's grace can be received honestly through faith. I'm happy to talk with you any time about these things. There's nothing more that I would rather talk with you about than these things. Maybe you're feeling the weight of the law. Maybe you're feeling the weight of your own sin. Cast your cares upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord, and he will save you. But if you need to talk, let's, let's talk. Let's walk through these things. Let's understand what this means. Praise God. Praise God that he saves sinners. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you save sinners. And it's not because we come with cleaned up lives. It's because we come with messed up lives. And you, by your grace, reach down in great love and great mercy and save us. And all we can do is say thank you. And then look to faithfully follow you. Lord, I pray that that will be the case. I pray that today you will draw sinners and see yourself. Open the eyes of unbelievers to see the glorious treasure that is Christ Jesus. And step out in faith to follow him. Help each and every one of us who do believe to continue to persevere in faith until the end, we pray in Jesus' name.